Hey guys, uh, this is Bible for Monday, May 18th, and bear, bear with me, I was about to say, because I have the hiccups right now, so do your best to stay with me. As I'm hiccuping, I will try my best to make them not um, very glaring, but uh, they're there. When 1 Kings 13, and um, we are, uh, it's, this is an interesting thing that happens during the reign of Jeroboam. It happens in, so Jeroboam, remember, is the king of the northern tribe of Israel. That's the ten uh, tribes. And Rehoboam is in the south, in the, what's called the tribe of Judah, but it's the tribe of Judah and Benjamin. Benjamin went with <coughs> Judah. And uh, he Rehoboam is in charge of those. The ten other ones split off because Rehoboam refused to um, lower the taxes and lower the labor force of the ten other tribes split off, and they are in the north. And they excuse me, are being led by Jeroboam, who used to be the head of Solomon's labor force. And if you remember, Jeroboam was told by a prophet named Ahijah that he would um, be able to reign forever if he uh, had only... If he only obeyed God and that he and his sons obeyed God, he would be king forever. Same prophet that I mean prophet, same, same prophecy that went to David. And so, um, but Jeroboam didn't listen to that. Um, he was instead was worried when people were going down to Judah because people would have to go down to Judah to worship at the temple because the temple was in Jerusalem, which is in Ju Judah, and um, so. Um, but Jeroboam didn't want people going there, so instead, he made um, he made altars uh, at um, two cities in Israel, and had and told the people, it's the same thing. Just just go there. I mean, what's the difference? What's the difference? Just go to these just go to these places. And he set up a golden calf and said, this is this is the same way you'd worship God at at the temple. Same thing. It doesn't matter, you know. And it's interesting because we should um, listen carefully to the word of God because often if we don't listen to the word of God. People can try to water it down or, or try to be like, nah, nah, it doesn't matter. You know, this is the, it's pretty much the same thing. I, you know, you don't have to listen to that verse exactly or different things like that. And they're going against the word of God. So let's talk about uh, chapter 13, what happens here. Again, sorry about the hiccups. Chapter 13. And behold, a man of God went from Judah to Bethel by the word of God, and Jeroboam stood by the altar to to burn incense. So this random man of God, we don't know who he is. He's just called a man of God. So he's sent as a prophet by God to go visit um, Jeroboam. Now he comes from the southern tribe. It's interesting. I don't know why God didn't use somebody from the north to speak to Jeroboam who's in the north, <coughs> but he uses this man of God from the south to travel all the way up from Judah to Bethel, where Jeroboam happened to be burning incense on one of those um, golden calf up altars. Verse 2, he cries out a prophecy against Jeroboam. He says, O altar, he's speaking to the altar itself that Jeroboam made with this golden calf. He says, O altar, O altar, thus says the Lord, Behold, a child, Jos Josiah by name, shall be born to the house of David, and on you he shall sacrifice the priests of the high places who burn incense to on you, and the men's bones shall be bur uh, burned on you. So basically, he, he what that prophecy is saying is there's going to be a king who comes and destroys this altar and kill, kills the prophets, the priests who are, you know, being heretical and being wrong and burning incense to these golden calves. So it's interesting. It says there's a king coming, and he even names him. There's a king coming of, of Israel whose name is Josiah, I mean, of, of Judah, um, or Israel, it doesn't say, there's a, there's a king coming, I was born to the house of David, so it'll be Judah, um, a king coming whose name is Josiah, who will take over this altar, specifically this altar in Bethel, and that's important, specifically this altar in Bethel, a guy named Josiah is going to be born, and he's going to take over and burn up this altar and kill the priests who are there. And, uh, and so that's a pretty specific prophecy. Now, we actually know what happens like 300 and something, 350 years later, <coughs> that there's um, a, a king named Josiah who does this. And um, But notice that the man of God doesn't give Jeroboam a time frame. 
So Jeroboam is expecting this to happen immediately. He doesn't know when it's going to happen. And so, but um, because it's not going to happen immediately, um, he does give him a sign immediately. The man of God in verse 3 says, this is a sign to show you that this is from the Lord. Because again, he doesn't know this man of God. It's just some random guy coming. He says, this is the sign. Surely the altar shall split apart and the ashes on it shall be poured out. And so it came to pass when Jer King Jeroboam heard the saying of the man of God who cried out against the altar um, that in Bethel that he stretched out his hand from the altar and said, <coughs> saying, arrest him. Like Swan pointed him, arrest him, you know, and pointed at him. But as soon as he pointed his hand, which he stretched out, withered. It says in verse 4, it withered. Like it became like a, you know, a claw or whatever and kind of with, withered up. So he couldn't really be use, use it, and now uh, and he couldn't even pull it back toward himself. It said it, he couldn't pull it back. I don't know how it withered, but it kind of withered and, and stayed out like this, and he couldn't move it. it. It just became some sort of injury, and um, and also at the same point in time, the altar, just as the man of God said, was split apart, and ashes poured down from the altar, according to the sign which the man of God had given. So this is pretty pretty clear evidence that God was working here he says this is going to happen and here's the sign that's going to happen is the altar's going to split apart and the altar, altar splits apart and jeroboam's arm also gets, gets you know all jacked up as he's pointing not pointing and so verse six you know he's left in a pretty strange predicament he asked the man of god he's got this arm withered coming out here and it's all you know all destroyed and he says to the man of god he's like um, at, right after just saying, arrest him, throw him in prison, throw him in jail. Right after yelling at him furiously, trying to quiet the man up. He's like, um, yeah, so I got the, this withered arm right now, uh, man of God. Can you do me a favor? Uh, can you please pray for me and ask God if he can heal that? And so it's kind of a funny position to be in, to be like, you know, you, how dare you say that? I'm going to throw you in jail and then go right to... Uh, Hey, uh, actually, can you pray to God for me? Can you actually, hey, buddy, old pal, you mind asking God to clear this whole thing up? Hey, forget about that, that whole arrest him thing that I said earlier. Yeah, forget that. I was joking. You know, whatever he said, he's he uh, he has to immediately um, ask him to clear it up because, and it's interesting, he didn't go to the golden calves to clear it up. He didn't himself. He knew that this was from God. So he asked, he asked the man of God, and the man of God in verse 7 um, and verse 6 does it and he prays and God restores his arm and I don't know if he kind of went oh man thank you appreciate it but he says in verse 7 he says come home with me and refresh yourself and I will give you a reward he actually I'm sure he's grateful and he's trying to figure things out here maybe he even has a moment of momentary repentance we don't we know it's not true repentance because um, you know knowing the future <clears throat> he doesn't turn from the calves, he still has people worship these golden calves, but he at least seems sincere in this moment when he offers the man uh, to ha come to his house. Remember, he's the king, and so he has the nicest house around at this point in time in, in Israel, and he would have the most food, and so he says, come on, come home with me, I'll make you a great meal, and this isn't the time of like coronavirus where people worried about germs, like this was a, this was a, an honor to go to somebody's house, especially a king. He says to the man of God, hey, thank you so much. Come with me. I want to give you dinner and everything like that. But the man of God was very adamant. He said, even if you were to give me half of your house, give me half of all the money you have, I, I would not go with you, nor would I eat bread or drink water in this place. For So it was commanded to me by the word of the Lord, saying, you shall not eat bread, nor drink water, nor return by the same way you came. And, and so he said, I can't. And he basically told Jeroboam, not that like, hey, I would never go to your house. It wasn't an insult. He was saying that God specifically said to me, bring this message, bring it to him, tell him this, tell him that. And then after you're done, God said specifically to me, after you're done, do not eat bread, do not drink water um, and at all until you, until you get back. And you can't even trace your same route back. It was a very specific, and so he tells him, it was a very specific command to me, and I got to make sure I obey it, because it was right from God, the same God who gave you this message. He said, do not eat or drink anything until you get back. And so he said, I, I can't. And so, uh, and so Jeroboam was like, okay, you know, 
he doesn't want to argue with God. Think what, what happened with his arm. But, so this guy is, it says in verse 10, he takes a different way back. Smart, smart right? He knows it, it's a word from God. He wants to make sure to obey it. But, verse 11. Now an old prophet dwelt in Bethel, and his sons came and told him all the works that the man of God had done that day in Bethel. So there's an old man who was living in that city, and he's told about the man of God. Now I imagine, I imagine that this <clears throat> this guy was he was called an old prophet, so maybe he had heard heard from God, prophesied in years past. I don't know why he is. He, I don't know why God didn't use him in this time. Who knows? Maybe he's been, you know, going off and not listening to God. I don't know. Maybe he hasn't been hearing from God, God lately or what. But he um, says to his sons in verse 13, saddle the donkey for me. So they saddled the donkey for him. And he rode after it, went, at, went, went after the man of God and found him sitting under an oak. Um, and he said to him, are you the man of God from Judah? And he said, I am. He said, come home with me and eat bread. Now, I don't know why he wants him to come home with him, this old prophet. Maybe he's trying to, I mean, all I can think of, there's, there's probably multiple reasons. Maybe he just wanted to have him over. Maybe it's just a colleague. Hey, let's have a colleague's dinner. Or, you know, the, the idea, this is something from just me, my brain. I don't know if any, you know, this isn't from anybody else, but just what I'm thinking. This old prophet wasn't used by God to speak this message to the king. I wonder, I wonder if there's a reason. Maybe this old prophet hasn't been really following God. Maybe he's been kind of, his torch, the light of his life has kind of been snuffed out a little bit. He hasn't really been following God, God as much, and he, so thereby he isn't getting maybe the notoriety. Maybe it's embarrassing for him that he wasn't the one to speak to King Jeroboam to hear from God. Maybe people are like, hey, Dad, why, you know, hey, Dad, why didn't you, why weren't you the one that spoke to King Jeroboam? Hey, uh, Bill, why, why didn't you, I thought you were a prophet and everything. Oh, I, I am, I am. And so... Maybe he wants to like be seen with this man of God. I don't know. I have no idea. I'm just thinking in my head trying to extrapolate here. But for some reason, <clears throat> he wants to have this man of God back home with him. So he found him. And he says to him, verse 15, come home with me, eat some bread. So he offers to the guy to come home just like Jeroboam did. The man of God, come home and eat bread. And the guy, again, in verse, in verse 17, refuses, tells him, listen, I can't. God specifically said to me, I am not to go to somebody's house and eat bread and drink water. I, I can't. I'm not allowed to. God said, give this me message, then come straight home. Ain't even that. Don't even take the same road. Come straight home. Very, very specific instructions from the Lord. But this guy said, hey, he said, I'm a prophet too. And I was told by an angel. Verse 18, he says this. I was told by an angel, hey, bring him back to your house and have him eat. And uh, it says in verse 18, he was lying to him. This is one of the reasons why, again, I think this old guy was just trying to manipulate the situation to make himself look good, or <clears throat> there was some kind of ulterior motive there because he is, um, he's lying to him. He isn't hearing from God. He isn't doing anything. I think he was an old prophet. Like he had heard from God earlier in his life and probably isn't hearing from God nowadays. And so he lied to him and told him, Oh, yeah, some angel came to me and said, I don't know, some angel came to me and said, bring him back to your house. And the man of God said to him, oh, they did? He said, yeah, come on. They told me to come get you and bring you back to, the, bring me back, bring you back to my house. And so the man of God said, oh, oh, okay, I guess I guess I should go then. And the man of God went back with him, even though he, he was lying. So, very difficult thing here. Watch what happens. We go back in that verse 19 and 20, and it happened as they sat at the table the word of the Lord came to that old prophet. Now he's speaking God's words again. I think this is probably the first time in a long time. And he cried out to the man of God, Thus says the Lord, because you have disobeyed the word of the Lord and have not kept the commandment which the Lord your God commanded you, but you came back, ate bread, and drank water in the place of which the Lord said to you, Eat no bread and drink no water. Your corpse shall not come to the tomb of your fathers. Of your fa and so that's one of those things that, not being buried in the same um, place as your family was like considered a really um, terrible thing back then. And um, God is very, very serious and punishes him here. Um, and we'll talk, <gasps> oh, excuse me. we'll talk about why in a second. Uh, verse 23, so it was after he'd eaten bread, after he'd drunk, he saddled a donkey for him and, uh, and the prophet uh, whom he brought back. So um, 
this man of God, I'm sure probably a bit shaken, saddles up a donkey and walks along this road. And when he was gone, um, he hadn't gone very far down the road. Uh, a, a lion met him on the road and killed this man of God. Not the old prophet, the man of God. And his corpse was thrown on the road and the donkey stood by it. And the lion also stood by the corpse. So this is evident that it wasn't just a natural occurrence. That this was definitely from God because this lion jumps out of the woods, rips the man of God off the donkey and kills him. And then both the lion and the donkey sit by or stand by the body. <clears throat> Sorry, just standing there. Now that's not typical be behavior for a lion, obviously. If he's going to kill somebody, he's probably going to eat them. Or he'd probably kill the donkey, but both of them just stood there next to the dead body of the man of God. And 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 there it said men passed by and saw the corpse on the road. They were walking. It was a typical path that people took, and they saw this dead body on the ground, and a lion standing by it, and the donkey sta standing by it, just right there. And they were like weirded out by it. And the the lion didn't attack anybody else. Didn't attack the donkey. They just stood there. And they um, went and told in the city that the old prophet dwelt in, in Bethel. And so this old prophet who had brought him back heard it, and he said, oh, it's, it's uh, the man of God who was disobedient to the word of the Lord. And, um, and he realizes what kind of happened. So he says to the, his son, saddle the donkey for me again. They saddled it. Verse 28, and he went and found his corpse, the, the, the dead body, the, the man of God's dead body, and the lion and the donkey there. The lion hadn't touched the donkey, hadn't touched the, the hadn't eaten the, the the man of God, but so the prophet picks up this man of God, puts him on the donkey, brings him back, and has him um, laid in his own grave. Um, so it's just like the prophecy said, he doesn't get buried with his own family. He gets buried in the grave of the old prophet, and he even says to the to his sons, when I'm when I'm dead, bury me in the in the tomb with this guy, lay my bones beside his bones, and. Um, and uh, and I, I don't know why he does this. Maybe he felt a little bit guilty, but um, but uh, he does this. And we're going to talk about um, – actually, I'll talk about it now. So it seems a little bit rough, doesn't it? It seems a little bit unfair for this man of God that he's going, he's trying his best to, uh, to obey the Lord of God. This, is really, this story actually bothered me when I first read it when I was younger. And um, it, it seems unfair at first that this man of God can be trying to do his best to obey the Word of God. And then somebody comes in a position of authority and who is also supposedly a man of God and tells him something different and he just listens to him and and he pays the price. <clears throat> and it seems unfair. And in some ways you can consider it unfair that the old prophet was the one that lied and the man of God didn't know it was a lie and he just listened and, and was punished. But... <clears throat> But, um, sorry, my, my thing clicked off the, uh, the Bible. But so, yeah, it can seem unfair, but here's the key. Here's the key. The man of God was given specific instructions by God, specific instructions by God, and he knew those instructions. It doesn't matter what anybody else says. That's the key. If God gives you an instruction, it doesn't matter what anybody else says. It doesn't matter what anybody else says. You need to obey that. You know, it doesn't matter if... You know, if you're, you know, it's your boss at work. It doesn't matter if it's your president. It doesn't matter who it is. It doesn't it? Doesn't matter if you've mom, your mom and dad. If God, if God gives you a specific instruction, you need to listen to it. The only time that we can ever, that's the only time that we can ever disobey, you know, a mom and dad, a teacher, or whatever, is if when it goes against God's word. If now that's not going to happen to you guys because you guys are kids. Uh, but like, let's say your mom and dad said something like, "I want you to go, you know, steal money from this store." Well, that goes against the Word of God. The Word of God tells us not to steal. So if they said, you know, hey, I want you to walk into that convenience store. I'm going to distract them. You walk behind there and you pull money out of the cash register. You know, you could say, no, I'm not going to do that because the Word of God tells me that I'm not supposed to steal. And your mom or dad could say something like, hey, I'm your mom or dad. You listen to me. But the Word of God tells us they were not to steal. So you could say, this is a time that I'm allowed to disobey you because that goes against the Word of God. So... But the, here's the key. In order to understand hearing from God other than specific clear instructions in the Bible, you have to you have to know the Word of God and you have to be mature enough. So none of you guys are at the age that you can hear from God. You know, I, I, I of something. Well, let me let me back up a minute. Of course you are. You, of course anybody can hear from God at any age. God spoke to Samuel, but 
you know, you have to develop your relationship and mature in your relationship a lot more before you're sure that it's, that it's the voice of God in, in a lot of ways. And that comes in time, you know, time and experience and maturity in God. Um, because you get to a point when you get older um, that you understand the voice of God. You've heard it a lot more. You understand what it is. And, and you're in a different phase in life. Right now, your job is to obey your parents. That's what you need to do more than anything else. Obey your parents unless what they're saying goes directly against the Word of God. All you have to do, you don't have to think about it, is obey your parents. For somebody like me, I don't have to obey my parents anymore because I don't live with them. I have to respect them. But I don't have to, if they tell me, you know, Mr. Hanley, I want you to paint your bedroom this color, I, I would say, no, I don't have to because it's my house. I'm an adult now. And so but I've gotten to the point where I've matured in, in Christ and I, and I know what God says to me. And part of that maturity is I like to take advice from whoever I can. If I'm dealing with a problem, if I'm dealing with an issue, I like to ask a lot of people, what do you think I should do? 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 I like to get all that advice, all that wisdom, and just and just really think on it because I want to hear from lots of people and then I will pray about it and see what God speaks to me. Because in the end, it matters what God speaks to me. And there can be wisdom, because sometimes God might not give me an answer on an issue. So in those cases, I'll take the wisdom and just make my best decision that I can. But there are other times that I feel God speaking to me, that I feel God wants me to do a particular thing. And it doesn't matter who says to me, you know, something different, like you should do this or you should do that. If God's speaking to me a specific thing, it doesn't matter who the person is. I, I might say, you know what, that, that's, I thank you for the advice, but... God's telling me to go this way. They could be telling me to go this way, but if God is telling me to go this way, it's up to me as an adult, as somebody who is in charge of my whole house, to listen to God. And again, I want to make sure I'm clear. This situation is different from your situation as as kids because there's <clears throat> we are we are under authority. So let's say let's say I am somebody who's under authority of my pastor. If my pastor tells me to do something. I need to listen to my pastor. I need to do, you know, that that job or whatever. My pastor says, hey, today, this week, I don't want you to do worship. I want you to clean toilets instead. I say, okay, sure. You know, that's where I'm, I'm involved in ministry. That's a ministry you want me to do this week. Sure, that's fine. But if my pastor said something like, because um, the, the only word of God that I have from that is that God wants me to, you know, to be under uh, ministry, authority in, in ministry. But if for some reason my pastor said something like, you know, I want you to go do this illegal thing or, or break this, break the word of God. Then I could say something like, no, the word of God here in this verse clearly says that that's wrong. And that would be a case that I could, I could say no to. But in, in, in things in my life, it's, it's a matter of me listening to God and hearing God's voice and being clear about it. It doesn't matter what anybody else says. So this man of God, he, he, and he was very sure he was hearing from God. It wasn't like he was like, I think this is what God wants me to do. I don't think God wants me to eat or drink. That's the key. You know, that's so many times in our life we're like, I think this is God leading us that way. Right? He was sure. He was like, I know without a shadow of a doubt, God told me, go, do not eat, do not drink, go back the different way home. And he was sure about it. So from then on, he should not listen to anything else other than that. doesn't matter what somebody else comes to. Oh, uh, God gave me a different word of, of, for you. Hey, let, hey man, listen, I'm just obeying what God told me to do. I'm just doing, that's fine. If if that's what God told you, then you go ahead and you pass the message on to me, but I got to listen to what God told me. And he should have kept going, but he didn't. And he, and he listened to the lie that somebody told him, and it cost him his life. So it's a really tough situation. But again, we oftentimes think of punishment, the, be, the biggest punishment should go to what we think are the biggest crimes. But oftentimes, the biggest punishments in Scripture go to people who know better, who should know better. They have a better understanding of what, what right and wrong is. And that's the tough part about going to a Christian school. There's so, so many benefits of going to a Christian school and going to church and as kids. There's so many unbelievable benefits. But you have to understand, you have a big responsibility, too. You have a responsibility that you have to obey the word of God because you know it. If somebody, if there's another kid who is the same age as you, but they haven't grown up in a Christian home, they don't know who God is, they've never read the Bible, they don't understand as much. So they have a little bit more grace and mercy um, because they just they they're almost like a, a smaller a small baby in their in their spiritual lives. They just know maybe there's somebody out there named God and that's all they know. 
But for somebody like you that knows so much of the Bible, you have a big responsibility to listen to it, to obey it, to understand it, to, to do your best to seek it out. Because um, that's what God expects us to do. He expects us to take what we know about him and do everything we can with it. So, all right, I hope you guys are doing well, and I will see you soon.